Good afternoon from California, where I'm joining you for this very interesting and important conference. First of all, I wish to thank the organizers of this conference, EOSCO, ICAS Kunza, and Institut de Studis Catalans, for having organized this conference and also for letting me participate in uh, this uh, creation of a code of good practice, which seems a very important uh, initiative. Territorial sovereignty conflicts, as characterized in the concept paper, arise where sub-state political community's intention and effort to freely determine its own political and legal status, including the nature of its relationship with the state, clashes with the resolve of the state government to oppose this objective or to unilaterally limit its scope and outcome. These disputes concern claims to a right of free choice by sub-state communities on the one hand and claims by existing states to a monopoly on the territorial sovereignty and the right to defend and enforce their territorial integrity on the other. Examples of such conflicts in Europe given by the concept paper include the Basque country, Catalonia, Scotland, Flanders, Faroe and Greenland cases. Further afield, the unresolved cases of Kurdistan, Kashmir, Tibet, Palestine, Chechnya, Abkhazia, West Papua and Western Sahara stand out. From an international legal standpoint, these cases are self-determination conflicts. In each case, the central question is whether or not the sub-state unit possesses the right to self-determination and, if so, what the scope of that right is. In many cases, the question arises whether its exercise may include the choice of political and legal independence or is limited to forms and degrees of autonomy within the existing state. The international legal approach is not the only valid one, of course, but it must be considered in order to safeguard the rule of law, one of the core principles set out in the concept paper. In my paper, I identify the foundations of self-determination and what the principle and the right to self-determination mean, who possesses the right, and how it is exercised. In other words, I primarily investigate the international law of self-determination, including the practice of states. But I also touch on the principles, philosophical and political foundation, which is the right of a people to choose by whom and how it is to be governed, which is equally a foundation of democracy. I will not repeat now what I've set out in some detail in the paper. Let me instead just point to some of the aspects and questions that may be of most relevance to the preparation of a European Code of Conduct. And I hope that we can discuss some of these questions during the panel discussion later. In the first place, as I demonstrate in the paper, the right to self-determination is not limited, as is sometimes contended, to colonial countries and peoples. This notion was never right, but even to the extent that it may have had some validity at some point in time, today that notion is clearly outdated and wrong. The right to self-determination is possessed by all peoples. To be sure, it's possessed by colonial peoples and countries and has been exercised by many of them since the end of the World War, World War II. But it has also been exercised by numerous peoples outside the context of colonialism, especially in the past three decades. The restoration of the independence of the Baltic states and the independence of a number of republics of the former Soviet Union, as well as the emergence of states from the former Yugoslavia, are obvious examples. But the choices made by the peoples of Eritrea, South Sudan, Bougainville, East Timor, Quebec and Scotland are equally important examples. Yet there appears to be a tendency in the literature and political discourse to minimize these cases and their importance as evidence of state practice of self-determination. One manner of doing so is by stretching the colonial category to include cases where the peoples exercising self-determination were at some point in time a colony of a European power. East Timor, Western Sahara are examples of this. We could also add Bougainville and West Papua to this list. 
Yet none of these struggles for self-determination were or are waged against the former colonial powers, and yet they are therefore sorry, therefore they are not examples that fit the colonial context. These are in fact all struggles for freedom from alien domination by a neighboring power claiming sovereignty mostly on historical grounds. This is the case also, by the way, for the self-determination struggle of the Tibetans. Another view regards most of these cases as exceptional and non-precedent forming, either because the sub-state units in question were part of a federation that fell apart, or because the governments of the states in question, for example, Canada and the United Kingdom, consented to the holding of a referendum. These are arguments I'd like to also see discussed during the panel discussion. Because in my view, if we apply the logic that where a referendum on the status of a sub-state entity is held with the consent of the state of which it forms a part, this is not really an exercise of self-determination, then hardly any cases ever qualify. Almost all referenda and all other acts of choice leading to a change of status of sub-state entities, whether in the colonial or non-colonial contexts, have occurred with the consent of the so-called parent state, even if that consent often had to be obtained as the outcome of protracted armed conflicts and the negotiation of peace agreements. Can we then, in all honesty, claim that when the Eritreans or the East Timorese or Bougainvillian people voted for independence in 1993, 1999 and 2019 respectively, these were not exercises of self-determination? Or is the argument that only referenda that are the outcome of armed conflicts can be considered act of self-determination? Secondly, I address in the paper how the principle of territorial integrity of states may limit the choices some peoples have, i.e. the outcomes of the exercise of self-determination they may legitimately seek under international law. This refers to the limitation to internal self-determination. Uh, and by that I mean to forms of self-governance within the framework of the state. As my analysis makes clear in the paper, such a limitation is only legitimate in situations where the state in question respects the right to self-determination of its constituent peoples. In other words, where it enables its constituent population groups to self-determine within the state's framework. This does not, therefore, apply to peoples under alien subjugation and domination, nor does it apply to peoples whose human rights and freedoms are systematically being violated or denied. This is also a topic I'd like to request some, some feedback on uh, during the discussion. The Supreme Court of Canada set out the criteria for the full exercise of self-determination and where self-determination can only be exercised internally in some detail in its 1996 decision regarding the secession of Quebec from Canada. And this decision is often cited, as it is indeed in my paper. The question I have is what authority should be ascribed to the pronouncement of a national court, in particular of a state in which self-determination disputes exist. Jurists from common law countries assign precedent authority to decisions in other common law jurisdictions, in particular within the Commonwealth context. But outside the common law context, can this decision and the reasoning contained in it be given any more authority than the opinions of other eminent legal jurists? Finally, although state governments often wish to treat self-determination conflicts as their internal affair, regarding them as a challenge to the state's constitutional order only, and addressing them on that basis, in my paper I show that under international law, the right to self-determination and its exercise is in fact an issue of international concern, 
and of international responsibility. That is, it creates obligations with regard to the behavior of all states towards the parties to self-determination conflicts. Obligations to respect the exercise of the right to self-determination and to desist from any actions that impede it. In the concluding remarks of the paper, I point to the potential for a European Code of Good Practice to expand the application of self-determination to embody the European experience and the European principles and thereby possibly also to impact the course of international law in this regard. International law usually trails behind political developments and is therefore formed and modified by those developments by decisions of international courts and tribunals and by the opinions of leading jurists. If successful, a code of good practice can have a significant impact on international law. But even its articulation, in and of itself, if backed by solid reasoning, can influence the course of international law's development on self-determination. Thank you.